Today we're going to perform a basic hip examination. This is a basic examination which I expect a, a fifth year medical s student to be able to uh, perform. Uh, we have our model here, Sarah, um, who is going to pretend that the left hip is the uh, symptomatic hip. Um, and normally in clinic we'd have the patient uh, more exposed than we've got uh, Sarah. We'd certainly want the patient's hip exposed. Usually they'd be in their underwear in a gown so that we can lift the gown to check for any scars around the hip. But for dignity, Sarah's going to uh, wear the cycling shorts. So the first thing that we do is I introduce myself to the patient as always. So my name's Edward Davis. Um, we're going to examine the hip. Is that okay? That's fine. Um, and then I'm looking around the patient, looking for any walking aids they may have brought with them, whether they've got a stick or a Zimmer frame, um, etc. And I would normally comment on that in the exam. So then, Sarah, could we ask you to stand up? Um, so as Sarah stands up again, I'm looking for the ease that she stands up, whether she's got obvious uh, facial expressions of pain, uh, whether she's grabbing for uh, extra pieces of furniture to get up. Uh, but she appears to rise from the chair very easily without any obvious pain. And I'm already, I'm starting to look for any um, uh, um, signs that I can see. I'm looking quickly whether I can see any scars. I'm looking for any changes on the lower leg. Briefly walk around the patient, again looking for any scars which I can't see. So Sarah, I wonder if you could just um, walk for us, maybe going up and turning around and coming back uh, three times. So as we're watching the patient walk, we're again looking for any scars that we could see, but we're also looking at the way that they're walking, particularly when we're talking about the uh, hip examination. Uh, the types of gait that you'll see is a, an antalgic gait where the patient's protecting that limb. We may be looking for a trendelenburg gait uh, indicating abductor weakness. We could be looking for, at a short leg gait or as um, a foot drop uh, gait that you may see if there's been any damage to the, damage to the sciatic nerve. Um, so we make a comment on the gait and we can also make a comment on how easy the patient appears to be doing that, looking at for pain uh, on their face. Now while we have the patient standing, we're actually going to do one of the special tests, which is Trondenberg's test at this point, to make the examination slightly slicker. So I'm just going to explain to the patient first um, how I want them to do, to do part of this examination. So Sarah, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kneel down. I'm going to place my hands on your waist and feel for your pelvis. And then I'd like you to hover your hands above my arms. I don't want you to hang on to my hands but my arms are there for you to grab onto if you feel you need to. I'm also going to ask you to stand on one leg. Don't do anything yet, but I'll just explain how I want you to do that. I want you to do it just by taking the foot backwards, okay? Um, so just by taking the foot backwards means you're standing on one leg, okay? So I'm just going to bend down. I'm just going to have a little feel for your pelvis now. So what I'm doing is I'm starting by trying to feel the anterior superior x spines, which can be difficult to feel, and we need to be just conscious that we're not hurting the patient. And I'm starting by feeling from inferior to superior until I come across the anterior superior spine. And that's the left anterior superior spine. And then I'm feeling for the right, which I've got there. And then I'm looking at my thumbs to see how they are in relation to the floor. And at the moment, if I was to draw a line between my thumbs, that would be parallel to the floor. OK, so if you could hover your hands above my arms, and again, they're there if you feel you're going to fall over. So what I'd like you to do is put your weight on your good hip or your good leg, which is your right leg. So what I'm looking for here is I'm looking to see whether my thumbs remain level. My thumbs are level with the floor, and that means that the abductors on her right hip are intact and functioning properly. If they were abnormal, I would see my right thumb drop as her anterior superior spine drops. That's great, Sarah, if you could stand on both legs. Now, I'd like to stand on your left leg by rising your right. And again here, again, I'm looking at my anterior at the anterior superior spines shown by my thumb position. Again, they're level, um, which means that the abductor function on this left hip are intact, which is holding the pel pelvis level. That's fine. Do you want to put your foot down? So we can say there that her abductor function in both hips is normal. OK, could I ask you to lie on the couch for me? So again, as the patient moves over to the couch, I'm again looking for any pain. I'm looking for the way that she moves onto the couch. And for this part of the examination, Number one, we want the patient comfortable, but ideally we want the patient as flat as possible. So we'll certainly go with one pillow, and then if, if the patient's uncomfortable in that position, we can lift the head of the bed slightly. Are you all right like that? That's or fine, yeah. Okay. So with the patient comfortable, again, um, we're starting the look-feel mo move process. So again, I'm starting to have a look at the hips, getting down again, looking for the place that we'd normally expect scars around the hip to be. And we'd normally expect a total hip scar to be on the lateral aspect of the hip coming down here, but going posteriorly towards the buttock. Sometimes total hip replacement scars can be within the groin. Um, osteotomy scars can be in the pelvis, usually in this area here, and a small scar posteriorly. Um, we're also looking to see whether we can see any sinuses or areas of erythema around the hip, which I can't. We're also taking a glimpse lower down at the leg, making sure there's no ulcers on the lower leg or skin changes on the toes that, that may be a contraindication to performing joint arthroplasty. 
So once we've checked that, we'll, then we'll start to feel. Um, the first place that I normally feel for is over the greater trochanters. So if I'm feeling for the right greater trochanter and I'm looking at the patient's face and checking there's no pain, and then we're coming over to the left greater trochanter and I'm just feeling up so I can feel the tip of the greater trochanter, which is just where my finger is there, and just gently pr prodding that area and looking for pain. And that's the area that can become inflamed with greater trochanteric bursitis. Then I'm just feeling gently anteriorly over the hip joint that sometimes can elicit pain if they've got arthritis within the hip. At that stage, if you find any masses, then you should check, obviously, that they're not hernias. At this point, then, we're going to look for leg length measurement. Um, and to do this, we need to look for real or true leg length. And this is mainly made off the anterior superior spine. So again, gently, I'm going to feel for the anterior superior spine, which is there. Um, again, looking at the patient's face while I'm feeling that. And then I'll take my tape measure. I'll place it on the anterior superior spine. And then I'll measure down to the medial malleolus on that side and take a measurement of leg length. And that's 92 centimetres. So we'll go on to the contralateral sign and I'll gently again, from inferior to superior, feel for the anterior superior spine, put the tape measure on there and then come down to the medial malleolus and you'll be pleased to know you have no leg length discrepancy. So that's true leg length. If we want to work out if there is a leg length discrepancy and we want a rough idea of where that leg length discrepancy is coming from, then we can find the superior part of the patella and we can again measure from the anterior superior time spine to the superior aspect of the patella and we can do that on the contralateral side. That will give us a rough idea of whether leg length discrepancy is happening in the femur or the tibia. Okay. If we want to demonstrate apparent leg length, then that can be measured either from the umbilicus or the point of the zippy, zippy sternum and again measured to the medial malleolus to, for apparent leg length. At this stage, uh, one can feel for the foot pulses if you think you're going to forget later. Um, and we can feel for the dorsalis pedis pulses which are present. And we can feel for the posterior tibial pulses which again are present. So now we're going to move on to, uh, we've done look and we've done feel, we're now going to move on to move. And at this point, uh, for slickness, I'm also going to include what's called Thomas's test, which looks at fixed flexion. So we're going to assess the amount of flexion the patient has, but we're also going to look for fixed flexion at the same time. So for this, we need to abolish the lumbar lordosis, which can occur when you have a fixed flexion deformity. And the way that we do that is by gently sliding the hand under the patient's back, and at this point, the patient will normally help you by lifting or creating more of a lordosis, which is exactly what we want to abolish. So at this point, we now could, Sarah, could you push down with your lower part of your back against my hand? And I can feel that now Sarah's compressing my hand onto the bed, abolishing her lumbar lordosis. So we know that this is the symptomatic hip and this is the asymptomatic hip. So now could we move the knee up towards your chest on this side, Sarah, for me? So in this manoeuvre here, we've demonstrated that she has full flexion of her right hip. And then we look at the left leg and we look for how that is lying on the couch. And you can see here that the leg is lying flat on the couch. My hand is being pressed by the lumbar spine and therefore she has no fixed flexion deformity of her left hip. If she was to have a fixed flexion deformity, we just see the, knees, the knee rise slightly, which would indicate a fixed flexion deformity in the left hip. So would you like to put this one down? So now we're going to assess flexion in the left hip. So could you bend that knee up? So we're looking for how much she can flex the left hip, and again, that's equal to the right, and a normal amount of flexion. But again, because I've left my hand in the lumbar spine, we can then check that she does not have a fixed flexion deformity to the contralateral leg or the right leg, which she does not. Okay, so I'm going to take my hand back. Okay, so we've done, we've done looking for fixed flexion, and we've done uh, tests to show that she has full flexion in both hips. Now we're going to look for internal and external rotation. And this is best done with the patient with their hip in 90 degrees of flexion. So Sarah, could we bend up? your good hip and here we're looking for 90 degrees of flexion at the hip and 90 degrees of flexion at the knee and then I'm gently taking the foot towards my body which actually internally rotates the hip and then I'm taking the foot away from my body which externally rotates the hip and we can use the amount of foot movement as a goniometer to express those values of internal and external rotation. We can also assess the amount of internal external rotation in extension or neutral position. That's more difficult, but that would be internal rotation and that's external rotation. Again, always looking at the patient's face to look for any pain. So if we just do that in the left hip, can you gently bend it up for me? So again, 90 degrees of both the hip and the knee, assessing external rotation and assessing internal rotation. Pop it down. And then in a neutral position, 
external rotation and internal rotation. Now we need to assess abduction and adduction. The important thing about this is to stabilise the pelvis and make sure the movement is not coming from the pelvis. And again, we use the position of the anterior superior iliac spines. And then I place my one hand on the left anterior superior iliac spine and I'm just going to rest my hand on the contralateral side so I know when the pelvis is moving. And then we're going to look for... Uh, this is abduction. And I can feel at that point, my left hand is starting to move, which means the movement is then occurring at the pelvis. And that tells me to stop because that is her maxim maximum abduction. Adduction is very difficult, and I would suggest at this stage we just try and bring the, the leg across the body for adduction, and again I can feel that her pelvis is starting to move at that point. If we want to try on the right side, again we're looking at abduction, and I'm feeling actually the right anterior superior spine, and I can feel that once we get to that point I can just feel it start to move, so that's her maximum abduction, and then taking it across the other way, that's her maximum adduction. Now, if we want to assess extension of the hip, we need the patient in a lateral position and we need to bring the leg posteriorly, but that's very rarely done in a normal clinical scenario as patients with symptomatic arthritis will usually lose or develop a fixed flexion deformity in the first instance. So at this stage, I'd like to do a quick neurological screening of the legs, and I'll do this just for sensation. So you feel me touching on this leg yeah. and feel me on this leg and it feels the same? Yeah. It feels the same on both sides here. Yeah. It feels the same on both sides here. Yeah and feels the same on both sides here, yeah. okay? And then I'm particularly going to look for sciatic nerve function as a quick screening test. So could I get you to pull your toes up towards your face, keep them there, don't let me pull them down, and then push down on my hands, okay? That's normal. So we need to do a very quick screening test of the lumbar spine now. So could I get you to sit on the edge of the couch for me, Sarah? So again, I'll be talking all the time about how she moves and it appears that she gets up from the from the supine position without any obvious difficulty. Now to feel for the lumbar spine you can either sit next to the patient or if the patient's near enough on the edge of the couch here what we need to do is just check for tenderness in the lumbar spine but I want to be in a position where I can see her face to see any expressions of pain. So what I'm going to do is just have a gentle feel down the lower part of the back. I'm starting in the midpoint of the spine checking is that sore? No. And then I'm moving across so I'm feeling over the facet joints bilaterally and that doesn't appear to be tenderness any tenderness there, and then I'm coming slightly more lateral and feeling for the sacroiliac joints, and that doesn't appear to be sore. Now, if there was any abnormalities at all in the examination of the lumbar spine or in the neurological examination within the legs, or I was concerned about foot pulses, I would also obviously go back and complete that whole examination in the form of a full spinal examination, a full vascular examination, or a full neurological examination of the legs.